We were going to spend a little time studying the church. We happen to be right now on Lesson 7. This, here's what we've taught through. Here's what, what we've gone through. And these are all messages that are on the YouTube channel so that you can go back and get refreshed. Or if you haven't heard him, you can hear him. First lesson was Jesus. It's Jesus Church. That was the first one. It's his church, not our church, it's his church, and we talked about that. Then uh, we talked about the key element of church. What is the secret element that makes us strong and makes the church strong? And it's a one-word answer, and the element is weakness. He is strong when we are weak. He is powerful when we recognize we are powerless. So that was lesson two. Then we talked about the full... Four pillars of the apostolic church. Four pillars, and that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You can go back and look at that. We talked on Mother's Day about the role of women in the church. And it was eye-opening for me, too. I loved it. I loved that, that lesson and what the Lord taught me through that. Then we talked about leadership principles and structure of the church in lesson number five. And last week, we... Uh, part one of the dynamics of church life, the dynamics of church life, and we're going to continue that today. So that is what your notes are about. Um, so let's let us um, read Acts two verses forty two to forty seven, and then we're just going to review what we um, looked at. See, this breeze keeps me on my toes. <laughs> Acts 2, 42 to 47. Let's read that. And, and this will give us, again, a look at the apostolic church, how they did church, and the dynamics. It, it uh, pinpoints the dynamics of their church life. Acts 2, verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them all, as anyone might have need day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So these are the things we talked about last week. Number one, the church, the people that were part of the church, did not think of themselves as autonomous or independent people, independent from each other. They could not have imagined thinking that way. They truly viewed themselves as one. We looked at these corresponding verses that you have there in your notes, 1 Corinthians 6, 14 through 20. And then John chapter 13 through chapter 17, multiple passages that talk about you need to think of yourself as one. As I and the Father are one, so you are one. As the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, so I am in you, and you are in me. We are one. We need to think of ourselves that way. And then we began going through what we just read. The means of grace. The means by which God works to secure our regeneration, meaning salvation, to secure our sanctification, which is the ongoing purifying process that we are going through day by day, and then our ultimate glorification. When we finally see him, we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. And the means by which God does that are these four things that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. First one being the word, the preaching and teaching of the word. 2 Timothy 2, 4, 1 through 5, Paul's final words to his, to his disciple, Timothy, before he passed on. This was his first final word. Timothy, preach the word. 
This is your main job. Preach the word. Romans 10, 14 through 17 talks about it. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How shall they hear? How shall they believe unless they hear? How shall they hear unless they're sent? And then number two, the sacraments. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. Jesus said it, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so the church established by the time Paul wrote Corinthians, weekly they would get together and they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. And churches throughout the last 2,000 years do that in some fashion or form on a regular basis, celebrating the Lord's Supper, the sacraments. We looked at prayer, the command to pray, and all those things. And finally, we looked at fellowship, and that's where we're at right now. That's what we're going to finish out on today. The koinonia. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, talks about the body life of the church. And the last verse of that section says, And do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and so much more as you see the day approaching. So Paul, or not Paul, I said Paul. We don't know who wrote it. It was probably written under the authority of Paul's name. But the point of that passage is in the body life of the church, it's imperative that you do not forsake getting together. Why is that? Why is that? The koinonia, the fellowship. We looked at the one another's, and that's where we ended last week, the one another's. Very famous phrase in scripture. And we wrote down multiple verses that talk about how we are to treat one another in this body life. And you can look at your notes, honor, be devoted to, be kind to, live in harmony with, be compassionate to, forgive, accept, serve, admonish, encourage, spur on to love, Offer hospitality and love one another. This is a command for us to do. Now we're going to look at the plural imperatives. And you're like, well, what do you mean by that, Dan? What do you mean by that? So, let's look at your notes if you have them. Pray. We are commanded to pray multiple times in Scripture. And the next one says, be filled. We're commanded to be filled by the Spirit, or with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, we're commanded to put on the armor of God. We're commanded to armor up. In James chapter 4, 7 through 11, we're commanded to, and then there's a whole list of commands. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near, cleanse, purify, be grieved, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Humble yourselves and speak not against one another. Those are all plural imperatives, commands that are in the plural. And then James 5.16, a passage regarding prayer, then it says confess to one another and pray for one another. These are plural imperatives, and there's more than that. So we talked a little bit about this last week as we were finishing up, and this was an eye-opener for some of us. When a letter arrived at a city, say Paul's letter to the Ephesians, when it got there, they all gathered together because they didn't have a copy. There was no copy. And when they read it to the congregation, they read it publicly. And as they're hearing it, they're hearing it in the community of the saints. They're hearing this in the community. So when they're hearing in Ephesians chapter 5, you all be filled with the Spirit. And then in chapter 6, you all be, and talking about putting on the armor of God. When we read it at home, you know, in our quiet time, at our table or wherever we spend time on our own in the Word of God, and I've always been this way, I look at it for me. Yeah, man, I need to... And, that's not wrong. But there's another element that's very powerful that we cannot forget, that it's a plural imperative. It's body life of the church happening. In this community, in this gathering, you all be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. 
Look at, uh, let's look there at Ephesians 5.18. We're going to just spend some time on this, just a little bit, and then we're going to move on. Um, Paul says, Do not get drunk with wine, Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, plural imperative. Be filled with the Spirit. Then look at the next verse. Speaking to one another. You see, you see the community aspects of being filled with the Spirit? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. You see right there how it's done in community, being filled with the Spirit. A parallel passage is in Colossians. If you want to turn backwards to Colossians, two books to the right, chapter 3, we see a parallel passage. Because oftentimes, the concept of being filled with the Spirit is we want to consider it like some kind of mystical experience or you know, an out-of-body experience or something that's going to manifest itself in a certain way. And Colossians 3.16 helps us to understand how to be filled with the Spirit. Let's just back up one step. A requirement to be filled with the Spirit is to be indwelt by the Spirit. He needs to be indwelling you. And that happens the moment that one surrenders to Christ. Jesus told his disciples the night that he was betrayed, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit that's coming, he said, he's with you and he will be in you. And then after he was risen from the dead and he spent 40 days with them, and as he's giving them his last commands on the Mount of Olives before he's taken up into heaven, he says, I want you to go into Jerusalem and I want you to wait for what's coming. And so they go, and there's 120 of them, and they're in the upper room, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, the rushing wind is in the room, and the flickers of flame are over their heads, and they bust out of the doors, and they start speaking in different languages to the great crowd that was gathered there for the Feast of Pentecost. That was the moment when the new age began, when the church age began, and the Holy Spirit had a new work in the life of those who surrendered to Christ, he indwelt them. He was sealed within them. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. He was sealed within them as a deposit of things to come. So, when any of us surrender to Christ, whenever that time is, as a child of five, or as a, a, a man or a woman of 65, the moment that that holy transaction takes place where one says, I surrender to you, Jesus. I, I submit to your lordship. I am a sinner. You saved me from my sin, and I surrender to you. That holy transaction takes place. The Holy Spirit enters your life never to leave. That's being indwelt by the Spirit. But here it's a command to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5. So that's something different. And if you look at Ephesians 5.18, it contrasts it with something else, right? It contrasts it with being drunk with wine. So when one is drunk with wine or another substance, they are under the control of, aren't they? So to be filled with the Spirit means to be under the control of the Spirit. How does that happen? Colossians 3.16. That was a rabbit trail, but it was a good one. Colossians 3.16. Here you go. This is a parallel passage from what we just read. And this is Paul writing, again, Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians while he was in prison. So he wrote them in a relatively short period of time. So you can see whichever one he wrote first, He's following the same line of thought in this next letter to the church at Colossae. But he uses a little different language. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And then he goes on to say the same thing that he said in Ephesians 5.19. Remember, 
as you speak to one another in psalms and hymns. So look what he says here. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to the Lord. You see, it's the same thing. It's the same result. In Ephesians 5.18, it's be filled with the Spirit or be controlled by the Spirit. And in Colossians 3.16, it's let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. You want to be filled with the Spirit. The word needs to richly dwell within you. You need to let the word of God just weave itself into your spiritual DNA. And you will be filled with the Spirit. And that is body life because as we are <clears throat> teaching and admonishing one another in the word of God, singing spiritual hymns and songs to one another, encouraging one another in the Lord, as all those things are going on, as we proclaim the word, as we teach the word, as we teach each other, the body life of the church is happening and the spirit is in control and the spirit is at work. This is what I mean when I say it's a plural imperative. We are all in this together, doing this together as the body of Christ. This is our, this is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. So we're not going to spend the rest of the time looking at the rest of these because you can go there yourselves. Um, at the plural imperatives. I just wanted to really focus mainly on that one, but all of this, the prayer life of the church. Okay, let's look at James chapter 5. we got to look there. James chapter 5. I want to show you something there. I did not start my clock. Somebody want to like, when it hits 10 o'clock? Okay. James chapter 5, we'll start reading at verse 13. I'm going to read 13 to 16. Is anyone among you suffering? He's talking about the church body. Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, they'll be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another. These are those plural imperatives. So that you may be healed, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So speaking about the body life of the church uh, and the importance of being here, the obstacle of being here, you know, I say, you know what, you better have a broken leg if you're not going to be here. Or you better have a broken arm if you're not going to be here. You better be in the hospital if you're not going to be here. I mean, you say that all the time, whether it's work or family function or whatever. Uh, you better be here if you're not. If you're not dead, you need to be here, right? We always say that. But this is what James said. Okay, if you can't come to the gathering, because if you're too sick, then the gathering needs to go to you. And body life needs to happen there right next to your bedside. And the elders need to pray for you. And you need to be encouraged. That's what needs to happen. We are not independent of each other. We are one. So that's what I wanted to point out from James. Now, last passage. Ephesians, uh, yes, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, you do not have notes on this because I didn't plan on spending very much time on it. I was just going to hit it, and then I started studying it, and now there's a lot of notes, but I didn't set them up for you. Um, so we're going to read verses 11 through 16. How much time do I have? What time is it? It's 9.41. Okay, good. Ephesians 4. 11 through 16. And he, that's Christ, gave some, my version says, as apostles, but the as is not in there. He gave some apostles, some 
prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor hyphenated teacher. So there's four offices that Christ gave to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints. And I used to read it, and also for the works of service to build up the body of Christ, but I can't read it that way. The job of those four offices is to equip the saints so that the saints can do the works of service. So that as the saints are doing the works of service, the body of Christ is built up. It literally says, for the equipping of the saints into works of service. That little Greek word should be trans better translated to equip us into works of service, into the building up of the body of Christ. So you see? You see where the work's really taking place? It's in the community of the believers. The jobs of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers is to equip so that everyone can do the works of service. And then verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The goal is Christ-likeness. We want to be like him. And it says in the scripture, Paul admits this, that we are all striving to become more like him. But it won't be until we see him, Paul says, when I see him, I'll be like him, for I'll finally see him as he is. So when that moment of glorification happens, when we're transformed from this body of decay into our glorious body, when we are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, then we will be fully grown. Then we will be fully complete. Then we will really truly be like him. And it will be glorious. But as we are working here now on this earth, we are working to help shape each other into his image. As a result, all of that work that we're all doing, all of that body life that's happening in the church, as a result of that, as a result of all of us attaining to the unity of the faith, all of us coming to a full knowledge of the Son of God, all of us becoming mature, as a result of that, we're no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We'd be rock solid in the word, rock solid in the faith, and not, whoo, it's so easy to get a hold of bad doctrine. It's so easy. It's everywhere. But rock solid in the word, not carried about by every wind of doctrine, or by the trickery of men, or by craftiness, in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, verse 15, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Little buddy that's been running around here, right? Remember him two months ago, his legs were that tall and he was that big and he was all wiggly and cuddly and now he's uh, a teenage dog and he's awkward and, and he's long-legged. And, but everything is the same, proportionally. He was little, everything was little. His head was little, his brain was little, everything was little. And it's the same with all of us as we grow, and all things that grow, we grow proportionally. Head, mind, everything. I mean, uh, a, a baby that comes out isn't going to go, Father, did you know E equals MC squared? But I've really <laughs> actually figured that out. You know, everything's little. His mind is little, his vocabulary is little, everything's little. But as they grow, everything grows in the head and everything grows. But with the body of Christ, the head is Jesus. And we are little still. But we are growing into the head so that we will fit properly under the head. The head is fully there. So that's 
what this means. We are growing up so that we can fit with the head eventually as we grow. Now, look at verse 16. We'll end with verse 16. The head, even Christ, from whom, Christ, whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's a complicated verse. Let's just break it down for a little, little period of time here. The whole body, that's us, that's those who have surrendered to Christ, the body of Christ, the church, whether it's a local gathering or the church universal, the whole body is being fitted and held together. So those are two words, fitted together and held together. The fitted together, being fitted together, is made up of three Greek words that are all put together. It's a triple hyphenated word. It means, the, the first part is means together. The second part means a joint or a part of the body. And the third part comes from the word logos, which we know we've heard that word many times. In the beginning was the word logos, and the word logos was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the final word. He's, and it means an accounting. It means to speak carefully about something in the sense of precision and accuracy and timing. It means the final accounting. So this word being joined together means that we are organized tightly together, but it's not random. It's God's divine intention to put us exactly where we are, in the place that we are, with the things that he supplied us, to do the work that he's called us to do where we are in the body of Christ. It's intentional. It's not random. None of you are here randomly. We are all intentionally put in a place at a time to do a particular thing that God's called us to do. The next word that's used is, so we, were, we are being joined together and organized and and intentionally put together in a certain spot, and we are being held together, that's the next word. Again, a hyphenated word, and the held together part is a word that's used in ancient Greek for boarding a boat, getting up on a boat. It could also be translated prove. And now that I'm a huge fan of the great British baking show, I really know what prove means because every time something comes out of the oven bread, oh, the bread makers. And Paul Hollywood's like, your bread is underproved. <laughs> or it's overproved. It wasn't pr proved properly. It wasn't allowed to come to the right consistency. It either was overproven so it blew up or it was underproven and it's too dense. It didn't prove properly. It needed to come to the right consistency. It needed to come together properly and it didn't. So, we are put in a place intentionally and we are put in a place with everything that we need to do what he's asked us to do. Everything. Everything that we need. As we move on in this verse, we are fitted and held together, intentional and with everything we need, by what every joint supplies. That's what we're gonna look at, those two words, every joint. The joint means ligament. So, this being together intentionally and being 
properly proved is on account of or by the instrumentality of every ligament, meaning everyone here. Are you an elbow? Are you a finger? Are you an eye, an ear, a nose, a mouth? All of us together, it's through that that every ligament, the supply of every ligament is kindled. And I say the word kindled because that word ligament, a root word for that word is to light a fire. Sparking something, lighting a fire. We are supposed to be kindling each other to do what? The word supply, it's not a verb, it's a noun. It's used only one other time in the Greek New Testament, but it was a common word used in, in ancient Greek. And it was a word that was used for a production that was gonna take place. You know, they were all into dramas, they were all into the, the, the theater, right? So what it meant was this word supply was to make an event a grand production, to put everything you had into it and make it something special. So God has given all of us something special to make a grand thing, an awesome thing, a thing that is a spectacle in the best sense of the word the church, the body of Christ, representing Jesus in this world. He has given us everything that we need to present to the world what the world needs to see. And that is our job. We don't dare think of ourselves as independent or autonomous. We don't dare as a believer in Christ. We need and are needed by each other. We need each other, we're needed by each other. And God has given each of us a specific supply of something to accomplish his purposes in and for the church. And those are called the gifts of the Spirit. And there, we'll go next week, okay? Because we all need to know, what has God supplied me? What is the supply I have to do what God's called me to do in this body or wherever I'm at, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the peacocks and the puppies and the kitties and the doves and all of that. and. Thank you that we could gather together on this Memorial Day and, and we could study your word together and fellowship together. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each other. We thank you for this local body that you've gathered together. We love you, Lord. Pray for your blessing on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.